All right, good morning, church family. Once again, uh, let me uh, invite you to find your seats. And as you find your seats, uh, if you would uh, open your Bibles uh, or type in your devices, the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. This morning we're going to be in verses 20 to 25. So a little bit shorter of a passage than uh, what I normally go through, but uh, there's a lot here. And so... um, the title of the sermon this morning is this, Answered Prayer Requires Faith and Forgiveness. Uh, and so I hope to show that from the text this morning. Uh, let's read the text, I'll open us in a word of prayer, and we'll jump into the exposition of our text. Mark chapter 11, beginning in verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. If you will pray with me. Father, I pray as we get to a text this morning that um, Jesus teaches us about prayer and uh, We recognize, God, that we need to be taught, as the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so this morning we we ask the same question, um, make the same request. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us um, what is needed in, in our prayers, that you would be pleased and that we would be in right relationship with you as we pray. God, show us this morning what this text is, is not saying and what it <clears throat> is saying. Teach us what it means to have faith in our prayers and what it means to have forgiveness and why these are indispensable in our prayers. God, would you help me to explain this text clearly this morning? Give us ears to hear. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we've been going through Mark and over the past few weeks and... Uh, Partly what we, I've been kind of jumping around in chapter 11 because the way that Mark structures chapter 11 is different than how the other gospel writers structure it. Mark kind of creates this literary sandwich where he talks about the fig tree and then the temple and then the fig tree. And I, I've kind of changed it around a little bit uh, to uh, organize it thematically. Uh, but this morning, uh, we're going to return back to uh, verses uh, 20 to 25. And so let me give the expo- exposition of the text. I'm going to go through this uh, uh, section by section, even though it's a small section. And then I'll give, and I'll spend the bulk of the time this morning on application. So let's look at verses 20 to 22, where Mark writes, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Now, as I mentioned, over the past two weeks, we have looked at these two independent but connected stories where Jesus curses a fig tree because it's not producing fruit and he overturns a temple because it's not producing fruit. As I mentioned, uh, Mark creates this literary sandwich because he wants us to see a connection between the fig tree and the temple. And this morning, we're going to get to the bottom piece of the sandwich and the conversation that happens afterwards. Uh, In Mark's gospel, this is Tuesday. This is three days before Good Friday. As they pass by the fig tree the next morning, the disciples notice that the fig tree has withered away to its roots. Remember, Jesus has, he just cursed it less than 24 hours earlier. So it's not like it's been months or weeks or even days. It's, it's been 24 hours or less. 
that he cursed this tree. And this, and, and this wasn't like a sick tree. Remember, it was in full, uh, it, it was, I don't know what the term would be, but it's it full of leaves. Uh, and so, and now it's withered away to the roots. So this is clearly a miracle. When Peter sees the tree, he remembers that Jesus said, spoke to it the day before. And he says to, to Jesus, Rabbi, Rabbi, look, the fig tree has withered, which is interesting because Peter makes this statement as though Jesus would be surprised by it. Matthew writes that when the disciples saw it, they marveled. They marveled at the fig tree and they said, and they asked Jesus the question, how did the fig tree wither at once? Now this question by the disciples, it reveals at least in some measure, a lack of faith, a lack of faith. I think this is why Jesus told the disciples, have faith in God. Because after walking with Jesus for two plus years, witnessing him doing miracle after miracle after miracle, they are still struggling to have faith in God. And so Jesus gives them this command. He says, have faith in God. Now, eight different times in the Gospels, eight, Jesus told the crowds or told the disciples to believe, to believe. But this is the only instance where Jesus specifically says, have faith. In fact, the verb for have, the Greek verb for have, it only occurs in the imperative twice in the Gospels. Once in Mark 9.50, where Jesus says, have salt in yourselves, and here, have faith in God. So Jesus is commanding them to have faith in God. Look at verses 23 and 24. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Here is another truly statement by Jesus. The word there for truly is amen. It's where we get the word amen from. Mark records only 14 of these statements, whereas John has 50 of them. And here's one by Mark where that he records of Jesus. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain. Now, it's not clear if he means the mountain they're standing on or he's pointing to another mountain. But um, we have to remember the Greek word for mountain. It doesn't necessarily mean mountain like we think of mountain, like Mount Rainier. Uh, that word mountain can refer to what we would call a hill. We would, you know, because we live in Seattle, we see Mount Rainier, uh, we, we call them hills, uh, but they didn't. Uh, this could easily refer to the Mount of Olives. And I think it does refer to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is only 2,600 feet in elevation. We'd call it a hill. Um, but that's how, how the terms apply in Greek. Jesus says, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, meaning like literally lifted up, and thrown into the sea, possibly the Dead Sea. If you stand on top of the Mount of Olives on a clear day, you can see the Dead Sea. And Jesus may be, may be illustrating that for them. Whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, thrown into the sea. And Jesus gives two conditions. Number one, and does not doubt in his heart. And number two, believes that what he says will come to pass. Jesus says, if these two conditions are met, it will be done for him. It will be done for him. Now, Jesus is basically saying the exact same thing in verse 24. These parallel each other. In other words, whatever you ask in prayer parallels speaking to the mountain. Believe that you have received it parallels believe that what he says will come to pass. And it will be yours parallels, it will be done for him. So Jesus is saying, not only can you say to this mountain, be uprooted, he says that whatever you ask in prayer, if you believe that you have received it, it will be yours. Now, these two verses open up a myriad of questions. You know, because 
give me a Mercedes. I believe. These two verses open up a myriad of questions. Number one, is this statement to be taken literally or as hyperbole? Number two, if hyperbole is exaggeration for effect, what is the effect here? Number three, what does it mean to doubt in his heart and why is this a condition? Number four, what is the difference between believing that what we say will come to pass, believing that, we, that, that what we say will come to pass and being presumptuous? What's the difference between those two? And number five, how do we reconcile Jesus' statements with our reality? Right? In other words, you know, you, you're pregnant, you're like, please be a girl, please be a girl, please be a girl, and it's a boy. How do I reconcile this with my reality? I aim to answer all these questions in the application. Let's look at verse 25 and 26. Uh, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. Now, let me address verse 26 first. You may have noticed that there is no verse 26. The Net Bible has a note about this. Uh, here's the Net Bible's note. A number of significant manuscripts of various text types do not include chapter 1126, which reads as such. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your sins. The verse is included in most later manuscripts and is not likely to be original. It is probably an assimilation to Mark to Matthew 6:15. In other words, the earliest manuscripts do not have this verse, and, it, and that occurs in multiple text types, which I know we don't have time to get into, but that almost is almost certain that it's not original to Mark. Um, but here's why it doesn't matter. It doesn't ultimately matter whether it's there or not because we know Jesus did say it in Matthew 6.15. You read Matthew 6.15, it's the exact same thing that he said there. I think it's an assimilation to it by later copyists. So even though it's, I don't think it's original to Mark, so I won't discuss it here. Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, you, when, and, and don't think that... Uh, that is the wrong posture. That was actually the typical posture of prayer. The typical Jew would stand praying. He says, whenever you stand praying, forgive, forgive. Now the word forgive there is a present active imperative, which means Jesus is commanding the disciples to forgive. Whenever you pray, forgive, forgive what? He says, if you have anything, against anyone, any grievance, any complaint, any offense, any hurt, any anger. And notice the henna clause here. The, that phrase, so that, is called a henna clause because it comes from the Greek word henna. The Greek word henna means uh, it's, a, it's a purpose or result clause. It tells the purpose or the result. And so here he says, uh, you are to forgive. Why? Why am I to forgive? What's the purpose? What's the result? Why should we forgive? So that your father may forgive you your trespasses. Now, two questions that that raises. Number one, does this imply, is Jesus implying that if I don't forgive, that my father will not forgive me? Yes, that's exactly what he's saying. That's what verse 26 and more specifically Matthew 6.15 is teaching us. Where Jesus says in Matthew 6.15, But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And number two, are we, why, why does he mention forgiveness here, right? Are we, in other words, are we to see forgiveness as another condition of answered prayer? Yes, I think so. I'm going to argue yes, and most scholars do. In other words, just as Jesus had just said that if we doubt, we should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. If we have unforgiveness, we should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. I think both are true. 
I'll stop there with exposition. Application of the text is where I'm going to spend the bulk of the time. Application of the text. I have eight truths. Eight truths from this text. Number one, marveling can signify either the presence of worship or the absence of faith. Marveling can signify either the presence of worship or the absence of faith. Now, Mark doesn't include this detail, but Matthew writes that when the disciples saw it, saw what? Saw the withered fig tree. What did they do? They marveled. They marveled, saying, how did it wither all at once? Now, as I said in the exposition, I think that question reveals a lack of faith. How so? Because why are they asking Jesus how in the first place? Why are they asking Jesus how in the first place? They have witnessed Jesus turn water into wine. They have witnessed him feed the 5,000 twice. They witnessed him walk on water, heal the blind, the lame, the deaf, the sick, the mute. They saw three people raised from the dead. If you had seen this with your own two eyes, is it so hard to believe that Jesus has the power to curse a tree and cause it to wither and die? Is that so hard to believe? You see, what we learn from this is that marveling can either be an, o an overflow of worship, it can also be the result of doubt. Often when this word marvel occurs in the Gospels, it's an overflow of the disciples' worship or the crowd's worship. Often that's what it is. But sometimes it signifies a lack of faith. This is why Jesus gave the command twice, do not marvel. He said to Nicodemus, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, John 3, 7. He said to the crowds, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all are who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Some marveling is not the presence of worship. Some of it is the absence of, of faith. The NBA playoffs are going on right now. Uh, the team that I'm rooting for is the Denver Nuggets. They were down 2-0 in the series, best of seven. Today is game seven. I can remember when I was a kid, I was a huge Chicago, Chicago Bulls fan. My dad was from Chicago. My dad grew up in Chicago, was raised there. So I grew up rooting for them. I can remember in 1993, the Bulls were down 2-0 in the Eastern Conference Finals to the New York Knicks. They were going for a three-peat. They came back to beat the Knicks 4-2. Now, was I surprised as a kid that they came back down 2-0 to win 4-2? Was I surprised? Did I marvel? No, not at all. Not at all. Why? Because I expected them to win. I never once thought, of course they're going to win. It's Jordan. <laughs> I was not surprised. I did not marvel. Of course they were coming back 2-0. How many times in the Bible were the Israelites back against the Red Sea with the Egyptians barreling down on them and God parted the waters? How many times have we seen God do that for his people? Brothers and sisters, do not marvel when God does the impossible in your life because you are surprised. Or do not marvel because your expectations were so low that God exceeded your expectations. Marvel because he did it again. Marvel because he did it again. Of course he did it again. That's who he is. That's who our God is. Some marveling is not the presence of worship. Some of it is the absence of faith. 
2. Jesus commanded us to not just pray, but to have faith and forgiveness in our prayers. Jesus commanded us to not just pray, but to have faith and forgiveness in our prayers. Last week, we talked about Jesus overturning the tables and telling them that his father's house was to be a house of prayer. And, and listen, I realize that any time a pastor talks about prayer, it's very easy to have this central takeaway. Like if I, any time that I preach any sermon on prayer, it is, it is all too easy to just walk away with one central takeaway, and it is this. <sighs> okay, I need to pray more. I need to pray more. That, that's the takeaway. Now, that very well may be true. That very well may be true. But here's, here's what I want to say. What we see in the passage this morning, it's not an exhortation regarding the frequency of prayer. It's not an exhortation regarding the duration of prayer or the content of prayer or the motives of prayer or the posture of prayer. Those are all important subjects. Let's be clear about that. Those are all important subjects. But what we see this morning is an exhortation regarding the quality of prayer. The quality of prayer. Jesus gives two commands in our passage this morning. Have faith, forgive. Have faith, forgive. Those are the two commands in the passage this morning. You see, one thing we realize is that it does not matter if we increase the frequency of our prayers we lengthen the duration of our prayers. We refine the content of our prayers. We examine the motives of our prayers. And we humble the posture of our prayers. None of that matters if we do not also have faith and forgiveness in our prayers. Number three. Hyperbole is not meant to diminish the impossible, but to highlight it. Hyperbole is not meant to diminish the impossible, but to highlight it. Jesus' statement in verse 23 is a statement of hyperbole. Let's be clear about it. It is a statement of hyperbole. Jesus is not suggesting that we could go get in our car drive down to Mount Rainier, get out of our car, speak to Mount Rainier, to uproot and be planted in the Pacific Ocean, and it will literally do that. That's not going to happen. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is using hyperbole. Jesus used hyperbole throughout his teachings. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. A camel cannot go through an eye of a needle. He's using hyperbole. If anyone does not hate his own mother and father, he's not telling us to hate our mother and father, literally. If your right eye sins, gouge it out. There'd be no men in this room with eyes and, and, and several women. He's not telling us to literally gouge our eyes out. Anytime Jesus uses hyperbole, there are two dangers. Two dangers. A, take it literally. Be dangerous, take hyperbole literally. Or B, which is probably the, the greater danger for us, to dismiss it. Take it literally or dismiss it. Why? Because it's hyperbole. Dismiss it out of hand. Thomas Schreiner, a professor, a commentator, and a scholar that I highly respect, wrote an article on hyperbole called this, How Hyperbole Dulls Our Spiritual Discernment. Here is part of that article. One person's hyperbole may be another person's truth, but I can think of several examples of hyperbole that I encountered over the years. For instance, attaching any importance to works can be dismissed as new perspective. Any concern for genuine holiness is called fundamentalist. Any reference to racism is labeled as critical race theory. Any restrictions on women in ministry are ascribed to patriarchy. That's true. That happens all the time. 
How does that apply here? You see, sometimes we hear people quote Jesus' words in verse 23. They'll say, faith can move mountains. And Christians can be immediately, can, can become guilty of immediately labeling them as charismatic, name it and claim it theology, prosperity gospel, or word of faith. Right, if, if you believe that God can do the impossible and you speak as though God can do the impossible, well, that's because you know, you're a little charismatic in your theology. You're a little bit like name it and claim it. You know, he's, he's, he's always kind of been a little bit of, pro, he's, he's got like, he's flavored with a little bit of prosperity gospel. The point of hyperbole is not to take it literally. That's why it's called hyperbole. But neither is it to dismiss it out of hand. In, in, in other words, like when we say gouge your right eye out, the, the point is not to be like, well, Jesus doesn't really want me to gouge my right eye out. And then you just, and then you just move on. It's like, but he wants you to do something. The hyperbole is exaggeration for effect. So what's the effect? That's what hyperbole is. It's exaggeration for effect. So what's the effect? And here is the effect here. What is the effect when Jesus says that you can speak to a mountain and it'll be uprooted and planted? What's the effect? Here it is. God is able to do the impossible. God is able to to do the impossible. When a doctor says that your loved one has terminal cancer, God is able to heal them. When a doctor says that a woman can't get pregnant, God is able to make her get pregnant. When your friends or family say, you're never going to get that job. God is able to give you that job. When you've given up all hope of finding a spouse, God is able to give you a spouse. Don't let hyperbole diminish the impossible. Let it highlight it. And listen, listen to me. This is so important. Don't think, all right, okay, pastor, let, we all know God can do the impossible. All right, I know that God can, but he so rarely does. Really? Really? Does God rarely do the impossible? Is it so rare? Because last time I checked, we've got about 42 members, and maybe more than that, who are in here saved. I can point to 42 examples of the impossible. Some of your stories, like, you know, we, we write it off and we must often say like, oh, it was just like, some of your marriages, man, it was impossible y'all got married. You're like, oh, well, Is it so rare that God does the impossible? How is Shohong a Christian? Somebody explain that to me. How do you explain that? How is Jen a Christian? Somebody explain that to me. Is it so rare that God does the impossible? Do not think, well, yeah, he can, but it's rare. It's not rare. We see it all the time. Four, faith and doubt are like light and darkness. They cannot coexist at the same time. Faith and doubt are like light and darkness. They cannot coexist at the same time. Jesus gives three conditions of answered prayer. 
in this passage. He gives one negative and two positive. <clears throat> Here they are. Number one, the absence of doubt. Number two, the presence of faith. Number three, the presence of forgiveness. Absence of doubt, presence of faith, presence of forgiveness. Now, why is one of the conditions the absence of doubt? Why do I need that I have any doubt in my heart? Because doubt and faith are like light and darkness. They can never coexist at the same time. Jesus had just told them, have faith in God. But if they doubt in their hearts, then by definition, they don't have faith in God. I love the story that we looked at a few months ago where Jesus says to the father, the father says, but Lord, I brought my, my son to your disciples. They couldn't cast it out. But if you can do anything, and Jesus says, if you can, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And immediately the father cries out, I believe, help, help my unbelief. You see, what is that? I love that statement because there's a war going on in his heart. There's a war going on between faith and unbelief. They are tugging at one another. And here's the thing. One of them's going to win the war. Either doubt's going to win and faith will be driven out or faith's going to win and doubt will be driven out. But they won't stay both there. One of them's going to win. Now, I feel this war all the time. I'm sure you do as well. Sometimes I, I pray for something. You ever pray for something, right? In the back of my mind, you know, I think, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I don't think God's going to answer this. Maybe a miracle happened, but you know, it's, it's unlikely. You, you ever think that in the back of your mind? You pray for it. I know the doctor said, you know, God, would you, you know, do this? But, you know, it's not looking likely. You know what James says about that thinking? Let him ask in faith without doubting, for that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. James 1.6. You see, faith and doubt are like light and darkness. They cannot coexist at the same time. Number five, faith is not just the absence of doubt. It is also the presence of faith. Faith is not just the absence of doubt. It is also the presence of faith. Now, this point is a bit tautologous, but I think the point should be made. Because sometimes when we pray, we don't have doubt. We might say, well, I don't doubt. Sometimes when we pray, we don't have doubt. You know what we have instead? So we have no doubt. You're like, okay, check, no doubt. You know what we have in place of no doubt? It's not faith. Often you know what it is? Determinism or fatalism. We think in our heads, I don't doubt, I don't doubt, but you know, God's going to do what he's going to do. I hear people in our church say that all the time. Well, God's going to do what he's going to do. I don't really have any say in this. Brothers and sisters, that's not faith. That's determinism. That's fatalism. That's not faith. Saying God's going to do what God's going to do, that's not faith. That's determinism. That's fatalism. We don't doubt God, but faith is not simply the absence of doubt. Let's be clear about that. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is also the presence of faith. There's a difference between saying, well, God's going to do what God's going to do, and I believe that God will provide a job for us. I believe that he will provide a job for us. There's a difference. Our hearts are like gardens and doubt is like a weed. We can remove weeds, but if all we do is remove weeds, 
You know what we'll be doing? We'll be constantly removing weeds all our life. Remove weeds and plant something else there in its place. Ask God to plant faith in your heart. The most effective weed killer is faith. Six, the antidote to entitlement is not low expectations, but healthy expectations. The antidote to entitlement is not low expectations, but healthy expectations. In Sunday school a few weeks ago, I asked this question. Should we expect God to forgive us? I've got puzzled looks. People looked around, they're like, is this a trick question? People sat there puzzled. They didn't know how to answer. Sat there for a little while, not sure what the answer. Should we expect God to forgive us? Part of the hangup was with, what do you mean by expect? What do you mean by expect? One clarification that was needed is this. There is a difference between expectation and entitlement. There's a difference between expectation and entitlement. I asked the question in the exposition, what is the difference between believing that what we say will come to pass and being presumptuous? Or in other words, how do we keep this passage from breeding in us a sense of entitlement? Right? A sense of entitlement, like I am entitled for God to answer my prayers. When I pray, I'm entitled for God because Jesus says right here, how do we keep from having that sense of entitlement? Well, let me answer how not to do it. The antidote to presumption, the antidote to uh, entitlement is not low expectations. You know, like I'm just going to have very low expectations and um, I'll be surprised if God surpasses those. Do you know what's another name for low expectations? Anybody want to guess what's another name for low expectations? Somebody? Doubt. Thank you. Doubt. Having low expectations of God is often code for doubt. The question of should we expect God to answer our prayers? You ever think of that? Let me ask you that question. Should you expect God to answer your prayers? Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I am not entitled for God to answer my prayer according to how I want. I am not entitled for God to answer my prayer in the timetable that I want. But I should, I should expect God to answer my prayers provided all the conditions are met. Which leads to number seven. Number seven, faith is not the only condition of answered prayer. Faith is not the only condition of answered prayer. Jesus says that if we say something that is impossible, like if I were to walk up to a mountain and say, mountain, be uprooted and tossed into the sea. And that's just, a, again, that's just a metaphorical way of saying, if you pray or say something impossible, and if we meet two conditions, we do not doubt, and we believe it will come to pass. Jesus says, then it will be done for him. It will be done for him. Now that seems absolute, doesn't it? That just seems like almost matter of fact, like, like we can take that to the bank. Not it might be done for him. Not sometimes it will be done for him. Jesus says it will. It will be done for him. Now how do we reconcile this with reality though? We all struggle with this because we know, how do I reconcile this with my reality? Right? Some of us, you know, we, maybe you've been praying for a spouse for, for years, decades. 
or a child or a job or whatever. And you're like, I don't have it. How do we reconcile this with reality? There have been people whose spouses or children died and they tried to raise their spouse or their child from the dead. They prayed and they claimed, they said, I don't doubt. I don't doubt at all. I believe that it will come to pass. But their spouse or their child was not raised from the dead. So how do we reconcile this? How do we reconcile this? Again, let me first address how not to reconcile this. I have been in certain Christian circles, you may as well, where they taught that if you just had enough faith, God would answer your prayer. If God doesn't answer your prayer, it's because you don't have enough faith. They read passages like this and they think, well, as long as we don't doubt, and we have faith, it says it right here, God will answer our prayers. The problem with this theology is that it's incomplete. Because faith is not the only condition for answered prayer. It's not. We are given at least six other conditions. At least six, at the minimum. Let me give them to you really quickly. Number one, forgiveness. Right here in this passage, we see that Jesus says we must have a forgiving heart. Number two, we must ask according to Jesus' name. Well, I don't have time to explain what that means, but Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus says this on three different other occasions in the Gospel of John. Number three, we must abide in Christ and his words abide in us. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. John 15, 7. Number four, we must walk in obedience. 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Peter tells husbands to show honor to their wives as the weaker vessel so that your prayers may not be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7. Five, we must have the right motives in our asking. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. James 4, 3. And six, the, the kicker of all of it, it must be the will of God. Even Jesus, who had perfect faith, says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty two forty two. 42. That prayer was not going to be answered based on his faith or whether he had enough faith. Jesus had perfect faith. It was going to be answered on, based on the will of God. Faith is not the only condition of answered prayer. So the title of the sermon is Faith and Forgiveness Are Required. That's at the minimum, not the maximum. Those conditions are necessary for answer prayer, not sufficient for answer prayer. Last point, number eight. Forgiveness is central, not tangential to our prayer life. Forgiveness is central, not tangential to our prayer life. The sermon has primarily been about faith and prayer, but Mark includes this last statement by Jesus in verse 25. Some scholars think that Jesus did not make this statement right here, but Mark just inserted it right here. Uh, that may be true, but we certainly see a connection between prayer and with what Jesus said, because he says, when you stand praying, forgive. And Jesus adds this purpose or result clause here. So that your father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. And Jesus even says in the Sermon on the Mount, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. What we learn from this is that forgiveness is not tangential to our prayer life. It is central to our prayer life. You see, unforgiveness is like an injury to a runner in a race. 
You can still run, but you won't be very effective. If you're injured, it doesn't really matter how disciplined your diet is or how much you have trained or how nice your shoes are or how pumped up your playlist gets you or how determined you are to win. If you are injured, that injury takes center stage. The injury is not tangential to the race. It's central to the race. That's what unforgiveness is for us. It's like praying with an injury. Forgiveness is like going to the doctor and getting immediate surgery done. Sometimes it takes time. Let's be clear on that. Sometimes we're stubborn and we don't want to go to the doctor. I've been to the doctor once in like 25 years. Physically, not spiritually. Sometimes we're stubborn. But when we do, he provides immediate healing. When we go to the Father and ask Him to help us to forgive, He provides immediate healing. When we're ready to forgive. Answered prayer requires faith and forgiveness. Let's pray.